I'm Grant Oliphant. This is We Can Be. Give, give a little, give a lot. Don't feel guilty for what you can't do. Feel empowered for what you can. Support causes you care about that your friends care about. Have an issue you're passionate about. Have three. Don't be afraid to change your mind. Be present. Be radically and fundamentally better as a human being. Smile. Be honest with yourself. Be grateful for what you have. Say thank you. Vote. Create a movement. Be the hero of your own story. Be proud of you. Give. That's part of the Giving Manifesto, written years ago and read by my guest Sloan Davidson. It expresses what even she didn't know at the time would become her guiding philosophy of giving and serving. Sloan, like all of us, knows the big holiday gatherings can heighten the emotions that inform our family dynamics, from feelings of love and togetherness to experiences of loss or friction. But sometimes that Thanksgiving dinner illuminates and makes clear the direction that our life's work will take. That was the case with Sloan. She is the founder and CEO of Hello Neighbor, which pairs refugee families with mentor families in a way that brings out the best in both and creates community in a way that is truly unique and sorely needed in a time when the concept of other is being used to divide us. She is making a difference by emphasizing empathy, and she has built her purpose around her passion. Sloan, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. The idea for Hello Neighbor began with a Thanksgiving dinner. Would you tell us a little bit about what happened? In the wake of the 2016 presidential election, like so many people, I really was trying to find a way to get involved. And I had been connected to one of the refugee resettlement agencies here in Pittsburgh, NAMS. And there was a program that was going on nationally where you could bring a refugee and have them for dinner. I happened to get a phone call about two days before Thanksgiving saying, you've been matched with a refugee family if you'd like to invite them over. And because it was almost most Thanksgiving, I thought, well, let's maybe invite them to Thanksgiving dinner. And then it occurred to me that I don't actually host Thanksgiving uh, you, at my You, you my weren't house. actually hosting the dinner, right? <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. So I said, let me call you right back. And I, I called my stepdad, who was hosting one of the dinners we attend, sort of having this Pittsburgh family of, of a few that we go to. And he picked up the phone and I said, I'm really excited about Thanksgiving in two days. Uh, by the way, I wanted to ask you if I I could bring along five Syrians who I've not met, who I think speak English, maybe not, to join us at the Thanksgiving dinner table. And he said, let me call you right back. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But he did. He called me back a few minutes later, and he had discussed it with my stepmom. And he said to me, you know, fishes and loaves. It essentially means, you know, we'll pull up more chairs, we'll stretch the food. And he said to me, you know, you're giving us a chance to be the kind of Pittsburghers the kind of Americans that we say we want to be, to celebrate the true spirit of of Thanksgiving and what it's about, how could we possibly say no? And so with that, I organized all of the pieces that it would take to have this family show up for Thanksgiving dinner and knocked on the door, sight unseen, and we shared the evening together. I love that image. It is so inherently what Thanksgiving's supposed to be about, right? Being welcoming and sharing thanks together with people. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious, from that moment, a lot of people would have said, wow, great, wonderful photographs, and this is a nice experience to have had. They wouldn't have thought to turn it into what they were going to do for the next part of their career. Mm. So how did that happen? Yeah, so the dinner ended, I drove them home, and instead of saying goodbye, I said, what are you doing next weekend? Mm. And, you know, as people sort of know me might attest, once you're in my web, (laughs) it's hard to get out. Mm -hmm. But we started building this very natural friendship together where, you know, I invited them to my son's first birthday party, and they had us over for an authentic Syrian dinner. And sometimes I'd go over 
over and before we went out to the museum or for a walk, they might ask me to help them read some mail or understand a lease agreement or just talk about some of their goals and things that they were excited about in Pittsburgh. And at the same time, I was at Gispia at the University of Pittsburgh in a mid-career master's, you know, really focusing on public policy with a focus on human security and migration. And one of the things that I was really surprised to learn, you know, is that when refugees come to the U.S., they're receiving 90 days of initial support in what's called reception and placement. And that's part of the federal program. If anyone can imagine your first three months doing anything, a new job, a new city, a new environment, the idea on that 91st day that you're just independent and you've got this, none of us would feel that way. And certainly for the refugees, lack of language, lack of a support system, you know, lack of knowledge of the culture. And I just couldn't shake this idea that refugees have to leave so much, if not all, of their support system behind and how hard that must be. 95% of the world's refugees are families, you know, are, are made up of women and children. And around the world, 68 million people are currently displaced from their homes. The amount of people that are displaced every single day could fill PNC Park. Mm. And so I just, you know, couldn't shake that idea that, that maybe there was more that we could do to support the refugees, not in the initial coming part, not in the resettlement. The resettlement agencies do a, an incredible job at that, but at what happens next. And when I looked at that white space, I saw a really unique opportunity, and I decided to go for it. And the unique opportunity was to help them with that transition into the 91st day? Exactly. So I started asking if I could meet other refugees. So I went into other refugee homes, and I'd sit on the floor and drink Turkish coffee and just ask them about their lives. And what I found time and time again was that if the refugees from multiple cultures had been here for six months or two years, very, very often they went to school, they went to work, and they came home, and that was it. They weren't out exploring, and not for lack of intellectual curiosity or anything like that, but just because they plain didn't know, and they had no one to really help and show them. I just kept coming back to this idea of what I was experiencing with the Syrian family I was helping. Maybe that was something you know that could be replicated. So I quit working there, as a matter of fact, because my family and I got threatened to death. So I had to leave. Hashimi and his family arrived in the U.S. in 2015. Hashimi was a stranger in a strange land, navigating a different culture. Then he received an email from a nonprofit organization in Pittsburgh called Hello Neighbor. And you will get to meet new American families. You will get to uh, understand American culture, uh, basically almost everything about the United States and about the people. So then I was very interested in my family as well. Their kids are uh, six, five, and three, and mine are six and two, so it ended up being perfect. And they love hanging out. Today we are Pirates game, first time ever for my family. In Afghanistan, people are very big fan of soccer, and they don't know anything about pirates. Walk me through how a refugee family ends up on your doorstep. How do, how do they come to Hello Neighbor in the first place? A hundred percent of the refugee families that are part of Hello Neighbor are families, so they have children under the age of 18 in the home. They all live on or below the poverty line, and they all have been in Pittsburgh between six months and five years. Mm -hmm. And so they come to us from a variety of ways. That very first cohort that I did a little over two years ago was me, blood, sweat, and tears, you know, getting to know refugee families and really building trust. I mean, it's not easy to have them open their doors to somebody new. I think for a lot of people, they think the fear is on the American side, it's us to them, but you know, they're really nervous as well. They don't know the city, this environment, what's gonna happen. I worked really hard. It was a lot of hours, a lot of getting to know people, getting to know community leaders, people that led places of worship, mm -hmm. you know, really talking to them about my vision for this 
and having them willing to come on the journey with me and help really guide what it would be. So everything that's in the program really comes from the refugees voicing what they were interested in. Today, two years later, they come to us from word of mouth. So I get stopped in parking lot or at the grocery store and, you know, I see a refugee that's in our program and they'll want to introduce me to somebody that they're with. We get nominations from a number of other agencies around the city. So anybody can nominate in a family at any time. We've had employers and landlords and neighbors nominate people in. And then we have active recruitment. So we're going out constantly. And we started at eight countries of origin and we're now up to 13. Are you oversubscribed? Absolutely. And is I, it hard to find families on the American side who will participate? No. Or is it just capacity question in terms of how much you can do? Capacity question yeah. in terms of how much we can do. Yeah, we constantly have mentor applications coming in. A cohort typically is between 20 to 30 matches. And your initial commitment is six months, and we ask for 10 hours a month. We ask them to do a mix of what we say fun and life skills. So it's really important for the refugee families to break that social isolation. So one week they might go find the local playground. They might go to the library and get the family a library card for the first time. But then they also might help them make a doctor's appointment, help them access a food kitchen or food pantry for the first time. They're a mentor, but they're also an advocate, an ally, a supporter, and ultimately a friend. We had one mentee, for example, a Congolese family. Their goal was to buy a house. It's a single mom. She has three kids. She works housekeeping at a UPMC, but she had saved up enough money and wanted to buy a house. We matched her up with a mentor where the mentor mom was a real estate agent and the dad is a professor of entrepreneurship because she also wanted to start her own business. So they did lots of fun things together, but they also worked on helping her learn about the process of getting a loan, of finding the right real estate agent to work with and ultimately to helping her buy her first home. I'm thinking about how a person arrives at the point in their life to do what you did, mm. how you look at the world through a lens of generosity and wanting to contribute something like you are. How did you get there? I think that to some extent, I have always had this over index sense of empathy. And Barack Obama says that if empathy is a trait of character, that it can change the world. You know, growing up in Pittsburgh, I think that that sense of, of community and giving back was always something important to me. It was something we discussed at the dinner table. You know, I, I started volunteering at a very young age. I walked past the Children's Institute all the time on my walk home from school. And I decided to go in one day. And I just walked in and I said, can I do something here? Because I walk by every day on my way home. I'm in sixth grade. And they actually said that I could go back once a week and get in the pool and help children who had been in serious accidents and were working on the road to rehabilitation. So I went home that night to the dinner table and I said, <laughs> I found this thing that I'm going to do. And my parents just looked at me a little bit like, who are you? Mm -hmm. So for me, I, I think a big part of the change in my story was going internationally myself. Mm -hmm. I, in 2009, decided to apply for and was accepted as a Kiva fellow. Kiva, of course, co-founded by Jessica Jackley, right, who's another right. wonderful Pittsburgh native and has become a dear friend of mine in the years since. But I was accepted and was sent to the Philippines for a six-month fellowship. Mm. And I was in you know the most remote villages. And no matter where I was, one of the things I always saw was even if a family maybe didn't have shoes on their feet or know where the next meal was going to come from or if the roof was going to leak that night, they had family and support to help with children and just to help give each other, you know, peace of mind through the day. And that really always stuck with me. Also, how incredibly kind they were to me. You know, I didn't speak the language. I was there working on a project, but they always welcomed me and they always wanted to feed me. They always wanted to show me around the village. And so I thought a lot about how, you know, really, even in the most remote places of the world, that, that sense of kindness, you know, always has really shown through. That part of my history, I think, has really instilled this deep value and this deep sense of what I do today. And in 2017, you found Hello neighbor. At that time, we were already having a different conversation in this country about refugees than the one we historically have had. We have a president of the United States who actually, as he announced his running for office, spoke about refugees and immigrants as 
rapists and invaders. That's language that has been adopted by the white supremacist and white nationalist movement. We've seen a lot of folks who are reacting out of fear about global immigration and refugee trends who are adopting the same language that we're being invaded. Did you have a sense for all of that when you were creating Hello Neighbor? Was that important to you? Were you trying to make your own small dent in the universe in terms of that language? I think it was a little bit of that, if the other side isn't resting, we can't either. You know, when, when I look at that language, the hatred and the racism and the xenophobia and the nationalism, it's terrifying. And I know that they're living that every day. I'm in the homes of refugees all the time now. I see the struggles that they're having on a daily basis. But I absolutely feel that so many people who f- are sitting on the sidelines doesn't mean you have to found an organization. There's so many ways to get involved, but the time really is now because we have to speak up for what we believe America to be. I don't think the civility will just come back on its own. I think we have to fight for it, and I think a lot of us are not used to fighting. And so I'm really trying to come to a place myself where I can embrace that anger I feel for what's happening and turn it into something positive. Do the families that you're working with talk about it, the refugee families? Does it affect how they're viewing America or their their own security? I mean, the first thing I'll say is I never like to paint a broad brush. Right. There's so many families, different countries that they're from, different levels of education, different levels of literacy, different levels of everything. And so I can't speak for all all the time. I actually think that's one of the flaws of the word refugee or immigrant or anything. It's it's they're all individual people. They're not monolithic. They're not right. monolithic. Right. Thank you. Exactly. I will say there's two sides of that. One is that just like any other family in America, they're trying to get by do right by their kids Mm -hmm. and thrive and survive. They're going to work every day. The kids are going to school. They're budgeting to be able to go to the grocery store. And that's really what they care about most, Mm -hmm. truly. Mm -hmm. And they access media differently than us, too, you know. So how they access it and what they see. I think that they are sometimes scared. They don't know what's going to happen when they walk out the door, if the women, their hair's covered or if they're wearing ethnic clothing. And I also think that they're incredibly worried for maybe other family members that were in the pipeline to come to the U.S. Mm -hmm. and what's going to happen to them. Because our entire system of how we've accepted refugees and immigrants has been upended. And that kind of uncertainty, I think, is really, really challenging and, and difficult for everybody. Where did the name come from, Hello Neighbor? I've always said, start somewhere, start anywhere. I think a lot of people, when they envision giving back, they say, oh, I'll give back when. When I have a million dollars to give, when I can buy that plane ticket to Africa and go volunteer for three months, you know, it's big. So when I thought about this program, I thought the hardest part of the whole thing is knocking on the doors, opening the door, and it's saying hello. And if you can get past that, I think you can do anything. And the second part, neighbor, absolutely we're in the enormous shadow of Mr. Rogers. What a Mm. gift to be from Pittsburgh. I grew up seeing him walking down the street and Mr. McFeely. And I think that in a digital connected society that we're in now, we need community and neighbor more than ever before. We need to get offline and interact with each other. And if that's debate, if that's conversation, if that's just spending time together, breaking bread, I think we need that to help us heal and to help us move forward. You are doing God's work. I mean, it feels like that. To me, you're doing the work of knitting community back together, of giving people a welcome that they need in order to be successful. And yet I'm sure you encounter blowback from people who see you as doing something that isn't good. Do you hear that sometimes from people in the community who are not sympathetic to refugees? Sometimes I wish I heard it more directly 
aimed at me because oh, I would I yeah. would love <laughs> right. I would love to have that conversation. Mm. I have a number of mentors in the program who their parents or someone in their extended family or someone at their workplace doesn't understand refugees or immigrants. Mm-hmm. So a big part of what we do is we educate the mentors on all sorts of things around refugee resettlement and what it looks like you know, all around the world and and domestically and locally. And, Mm. um, you know, my big dream is that they come out of the program and they have a ton of really great stories they can share about the Congolese family, the Mm. Syrian family Mm. they got to know, but also facts and figures. A problem I see right now is we're really divided and that the place and the space for debate of people who feel differently, I think, is diminishing. What are the things that we get wrong about refugees right now? What are the mis- perceptions that you're trying to help people clear up and better understand the lives of refugees? We do a series of myth busters Mm. in our orientation. Mm. So one of the big ones we talk about is refugees are a vetted population. They're coming into our country fully vetted. There is no such thing as an illegal refugee. Mm. It doesn't exist. And so coming here, they get a social security number. They're immediately contributing to society. I talk about refugees and I say there's two main arguments you can take. You can take the moral concept, the moral obligation we have since World War II and the Holocaust to say that we turned our backs on the world's refugees and as a world we need to look at what happened then and promise that it will never happen again. But the second is economic. Refugees are helping to pay for teacher salaries and police pensions and potholes Mm -hmm. because they're paying in for taxes. So that's a really big one. And I think a lot of people, you know, also think that they're just in it for the social benefits. And they're really not. Far and away, the biggest thing I want to say is that everyone is sacrificing for their children, Mm -hmm. just like immigrants since the beginning of time. You know, we have refugees in our program that have master's degrees, but little English, and they're being told their first job should be in housekeeping at a hotel. That's incredibly humbling for someone who is a university professor. They're all really doing this to give their children a better life. The other day I was at a refugee's house visiting and we were going outside. I asked her to show me this beautiful garden she had in the backyard. She had, was growing some peppers from her native Bhutan that she couldn't find here and had some tomatoes. And she leaned down to help her five-year-old put on his shoes. And I don't know what happened, but this wave of emotion rushed over me and I thought every mother in the world Mm-hmm. leans down to help their kids put on their shoes. Mm-hmm. We're all just people, and we're all really just trying to do right by our families and give our children a better life than the one we have. Uh, but what do you say to people who look at this moment and say, that's all well and good, but their problems are their problems, they're not my problems, and there are too many, and we can't afford them, and we can't fit them How do you respond to that as somebody who is working with refugees every day? My offline response or my actual response? Oh, I mean, you're, 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 well, give us, give us both, you know, because this is the rhetoric that we're hearing. And forget about the president for a moment. You know, there is a whole set of people in the country now who believe way worse than what I just articulated. Yes. I mean, if I was, you know, in one of my tough moments, I would say that someone is being complicit in the rise of white nationalism. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, on a softer side, I would say that, you know, Maya Angelou said, we are not our brother and sister's keepers. We are our brothers. We are our sisters. Mm -hmm. There is no excuse for turning our backs on what's happening around the world and certainly what's happening locally. And I also feel very strongly that we make room for things we care about and If people don't actually know a refugee, don't know an immigrant, don't assume to think that you know their experience or what they're going through, far and away, they would rather be back home in their home country without the war, without the conflict. This idea that everyone's just hunky-dory, happy being here, they're missing so much of their home. I lived away from Pittsburgh for 16 years, and no matter what, I could close my eyes and I could picture 
my house. I could picture the walk I took to and from school. I could picture the trees. I could sometimes feel the breeze. I could feel that whole experience. And I could at any point in time come back to Pittsburgh, go to that street, walk up to the house and see that house again. Every single refugee that I know, and this is universal, they cannot go back. That house is gone. That street is gone. That life that they knew is gone. And they would give anything to have it back. What are some of the things that you've heard from refugee families as you've worked with them that give you inspiration and hope? Oh, I hear so many stories. We've seen a number of our families, you know, the women get driver's license and be able to go out and get a job. We've seen families enroll, you know, enroll in CCAC and and be able to take classes. This is the community college. Community college, yeah. You know, but one of the big ones I've seen is that we've had 16 Hello Neighbor babies born since we started the program. Okay, explain that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in our we have 95 families that we we've now supported throughout the program and there's 16 new babies that have been born despite everything that's happening at the national level, the conversation, the closing the borders, the reducing refugee resettlement numbers, all of that, families are still living their lives and mm. they're still having babies and moving forward and each of those babies is the first american citizen Mm -hmm. in their family Mm -hmm. and that's absolutely like just my favorite thing this one afghan dad he's so proud to be here and to be in pittsburgh immediately all black and gold Mm -hmm. like he's just (laughs) like pittsburgher through and through and he had a new baby and he has two other children and i went to the hospital to congratulate them and he pointed at two other kids and he said these kids Afghan American, and he pointed at the new baby, and he said, "This baby, American mm-hmm. Afghan." <laughs> and Love so I, I really, you know, when I think of joy and hope, of course, it's happening across education and housing and employment and day to day life. But I just think the biggest one is that the families are continuing to invest in themselves and having new mm-hmm. children, new hope. Is that what sustains you in this work? Absolutely. The refugees, they're the resilient. They're the amazing. They're the change agents. I'm just the voice and some of the muscle, certainly. (laughs) I'm a lot of the muscle. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, they give me so much hope. I'm exhausted at the end of every day, Mm. but... Um, I come from good Eastern European immigrant stock myself, so I think that I need to feel exhausted at the end of every day. It makes me feel better as a person to feel like I've done everything that I, that I possibly could. So the name of this program is We Can Be, and it's kind of an incomplete sentence. How would you complete it? We can be more loving, more empathetic to our neighbors and those around us. Sloan, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Please, won't you be my neighbor? My neighbor? We are all living in the shadow of Mr. Rogers, and we have the opportunity to define what our communities can be. We can create neighborhoods that are truly welcoming places where we don't just talk about kindness and openness, but actually are loving and accepting. Sloan and Hello Neighbor are a beam of hope during a time when we're being told that those from other countries are the enemy. They are not the enemy. Lack of empathy and action are the real enemy. The danger is that we will forget who we are as Americans and as Pittsburghers. As Sloan said, the other side isn't resting, so we won't rest either.